which is called, I gave it the title, Moving from Devotion to Wisdom. We can say moving from faith to wisdom. So in one of the sets of factors in the Buddha's system of training, of spiritual training, is the five spiritual faculties. So the five spiritual faculties, the first is faith, sadda or sadindriya, the faculty of faith. And that is probably always defined in the text that the disciple has sadda, faith, in the enlightenment of the Buddha. And in the Buddha system, like faith is not sufficient in itself, certainly, for liberation. Faith and devotion play mainly an instrumental role, sort of in paving the way for wisdom. <laughs> this is quite different from the role of faith and devotion in the bhakti yoga system of Hinduism. <laughs> if you've ever seen the, <laughs> the Hare Krishna devotees, I don't know if they're still around. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I remember back in the late 1960s, early 1970s, it became like a big thing on the American spiritual scene. <laughs> Almost every street corner, and no, that's exactly. <laughs> I should say maybe at a street corner in almost every city, not yes. at every street corner. <laughs> every major, in every major city, at some like the city square, there would be the group of the Hare Krishnaites with the, actually it would be a kind of robes like this, and with a little tuft of hair, <laughs> and chanting and singing. And then dancing, <laughs> Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. They even made it into a film. Well, they got into a film, a Woody Allen film. What was the film? <laughs> Hannah and Her Sisters, I think. <laughs> where Woody Allen was trying to find the meaning of life, and going around <laughs> like to the Catholic Church, reading Catholic <laughs> documents. Then he passes a a park where he sees the Hare Krishna it's dancing and approaches them. <laughs> so that kind of approach to devotion emphasizes a kind of ecstatic losing oneself in that feeling of devotion. But in Buddhism, devotion, first it has an instrumental role towards the leading towards the development of wisdom. And it's the wisdom, I think the wisdom faculty in Buddhism, which gives a kind of cool and restrained tone to the devotional side of Buddhist practice. And there's a particular, I call this a juncture, where faith and wisdom sort of come together or converge. And that juncture is right view, samaditi. So when we use the translation right view, it seems to imply that you can always see the content of what is indicated by right view. But that is actually not the case, certainly not the case at the beginning, or even through a large part of the middle of our practice. And so, looking at right view, I distinguish here three aspects to right view, and each of them involves some degree of, I call this, trusting confidence in what the Buddha teaches. So that is why in developing the recollection of the Buddha, I say one of the qualities that goes into that um, recollection of the Buddha, one of the qualities to be generated is trusting confidence. Because it's that trusting confidence that disposes one to accept what, I say almost, and certainly comes from the Buddha himself, the teachings that are core fundamental teachings, expounded by the Buddha, which we cannot directly and immediately see for ourselves. 
And so if we don't have that trusting confidence and we encounter these teachings, then we can develop a kind of skeptical reserve towards them. <laughs> Did somebody come to this? Just had a delivery, apparently. Oh, I see. <laughs> okay. They apparently, for when with the ringing the bell step of the operation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's that trusting confidence that disposes one to accept on trust from the Buddha what we cannot directly see and confirm for ourselves. And if one doesn't have that trusting confidence, of course, then one can appreciate and cherish many teachings of the Buddha, but that skeptical reserve will prevent one from making that full commitment to the Dhamma that will eventually culminate in liberation. Okay, so I distinguish three aspects of right view in which the trusting confidence that comes along with faith enables one to accept these principles which are difficult for us to see immediately for ourselves. One of these is the teaching of karma and its results. I call this the mundane right view because it's concerned with the laws that operate within the fold of samsara, within the fold of conditioned existence. So. The law of karma is one of those laws that govern the working of events, particularly in human existence or other forms of sentient existence within the domain of conditioned existence. So what the teaching of karma holds, basically, in a nutshell, is that our volitional actions, our willed actions, actions that spring from the will from volition have a capacity to bring results that correspond to the ethical nature of those actions. So this doesn't mean the sort of common misunderstanding of karma is that everything that happens to us is happening as a result of past karma. I don't think that's true, and I don't think that is the intention of the text. There are probably many different contributing factors, but many different factors that contribute to what is governing our, pre our present condition, our present experience, and karma is one of them, but not the only one. But what, the way I see the principle of karma, it's teaching that it's our actions in the present have the capacity capacity to produce results in the future. And many of the things that happen to us in the present, not everything, but a lot of the things, are happening through the maturation of past karma. So the basic principle of karma is, as stated here, as a reflection, this is a passage that occurs in the um, Guttana Nikaya, probably elsewhere, the Buddha says that there are five things that every disciple should frequently reflect upon, whether he says a woman or a man, a householder or a monastic, one should reflect that I am the owner of my karma, that is, we are responsible for our actions, that we can't escape our, our actions. We are the heir of our actions. So once we commit volitional actions, they remain with us. They're part of our inheritance, so to speak. So we have karma as my origin. The word is yoni, which is like the womb. The sort of the womb out of which we're born is our karma. Karma is my relative. So we, in a sense, we break the relations with all of our other relatives when we pass on to a new existence though they might follow us to, <laughs> to, the new, to the new life. <laughs> but a lot of those relations get broken, but the karma remains with us. The word here, relative, is actually bandhu, 
which is related to bond. <coughs> We're bound to our karma in a sense. And karma is both my relative, karma is my resort. So what we resort to as a kind of our refuge, as a way of achieving a good destination is our karma. Then I will be the heir of whatever karma, good or bad, I do. So that's why we have to be especially careful with our actions, and these are the volitional actions, actions of body, speech, and mind, because all of those actions deposit a kind of seed in the mind. That those are the seeds of karma. And those seeds, the action is done and finished. We might even forget about the actions that we've done. But those seeds are there within the deep levels of the substratum of consciousness. And when they meet the opportunity, then they will come to maturity. So, in a nutshell, that is the principle of karma. And that's one of the aspects that the Buddha says, that this is one of the aspects of right view. So we find amongst the <laughs> ten courses of wholesome, first the ten courses of unwholesome karma, one of those, the tenth course of unwholesome karma is wrong view. And one aspect of wrong view <laughs> is the denial that there's a distinction between good and bad, wholesome and wholesome, and a denial that our good and bad deeds bring corresponding results. And so, amongst the ten types of wholesome karma, the tenth is right view, and that right view is the mundane right view. It's the right view that there is this valid distinction between the wholesome and the unwholesome, and the view that our wholesome and unwholesome actions bring corresponding results. That is the mundane aspect of right view. Okay, then there is the... Okay, and so unless one... If one develops what's called the deeper chakra, the divine eye, which the Buddha developed on the night of his enlightenment, and many of the very accomplished disciples of the Buddha developed the divine eye, then one can, they say, directly see the workings of karma itself. One can see beings passing away and taking rebirth in a, this realm or other realms, and one sees how beings reap the results of their actions. Those who do unwholesome actions are reborn in the lower realms and meet with suffering and misery. Those who do wholesome actions take rebirth in the higher realms and meet with good fortune. So that is what is seen with the divine eye. But until one develops the divine eye, we take it on trust, this trusting confidence that there is this invisible but universal moral law at work within the sphere of sentient beings. So that is one principle of taken of right view accepted on trust. Okay, the next type of right view is what we call the Lokutra or the world transcending right view. The right view that leads to liberation. And this is the right view of the Four Noble Truths. So we probably everybody is familiar with the Four Noble Truths. The truth of dukkha, usually translated somewhat, not fully satisfactorily, as suffering, but also having the meaning of def things being deficient, inadequate, defective, or things being not perfect, somehow out of balance. And then the truth of dukkha, this is where we start moving into trust. Okay, the various types of dukkha that the Buddha enumerates, he starts off with things we could readily see. These are clear, concrete, experiential types of dukkha. Well, maybe we don't remember our 
of birth. <laughs> but at least we have old age. I'm starting to feel that. This is good. <laughs> um, illness. Then there's death. Okay. <laughs> Everybody here is still alive, so I can't ask what you really agree that death is But we look towards it as being dukkha. Then there is separation from what is loved, pleasant, agreeable, the union what, with coming together with what is unpleasant, disagreeable, not to get what one wants, that is dukkha. So those are clear types of psychological suffering and dissatisfaction. But then the Buddha makes a statement that I'm going to come to more fully l later that the five aggregates which are subject to clinging are dukkha. So those are the five things, the five constituents that make up our being. Bodily form, feeling, perception, the volitional activities, consciousness. So that is dukkha. So that requires, I'd say, a degree of trusting confidence which we can sort of launch into that from the visible and concrete types of suffering that we actually experience, then out of trust in the Buddha, we're willing to accept that the five aggregates in, to in totality are dukkha. Okay, then, of course, the origin of dukkha, the craving as being the origin of dukkha, to some extent we could see that in our own experience. We see, okay, Yesterday we had was it, six ice varieties of ice cream. <laughs> and of course, at lunchtime today, when I went into the kitchen, I was looking around. <laughs> Where is it? <laughs> Maybe I should have reminded them. What <laughs> and then I was thinking, okay, <laughs> we went today to one attribute of the Buddha, so at least they could have provided one kind of ice cream. <laughs> but none, no ice cream. <laughs> okay, so there's a dukkha. <laughs> and that's actually a, that's a trivial um, type of dukkha, but there are, you know, very serious types of dukkha that come, we could see, rooted in, directly rooted in craving. But there are aspects, relations between craving and dukkha that are not so clearly visible that the Buddha teaches. Very subtle aspects to that relationship. Okay, then we might see in experience, know in experience, how reducing craving reduces our dukkha. So I reflect, what is ice cream? It's just enjoying a taste that passes. So I diminish, reduce my craving for the ice cream. So when there's no ice cream, no dukkha. <laughs> I'm laughing because <laughs> I found in the other room, uh -oh, on the bookcase, a copy of a novel as part of the great a series, of, a series of novels by Marcel Proust. <laughs> <laughs> Remembrance of Things Past. Now, I had never read Proust before, and I always heard that he was like the greatest French novelist of the 20th century. So I was picking it up. Is that your novel? It could be. He's I'm actually a, sure. a magnificent writer. And he was, I get the gist of this novel, The Sweet Cheat Gone. He had a girlfriend named Albert, Albertine, yes. who left him, and then she died after leaving him. And so he was struck with the pain of her, first the pain of he, her departure, and then the pain of her death. And he's always trying to recall the memories of her, and you know, how they were in love together. And then after her death, he has to try to reduce 
reduce the pain of that deep posture by trying to reflect in ways that will reduce that attachment that he had to her. And I was just thinking how appropriate that is for <laughs> this point that I'm just making right now. It was a very, very fortunate consequence that I came across that passage. Except continuing in the novel, I see that <laughs> After he sort of gotten over the pain of losing Albertine, <laughs> he catches sight of a group of three girls. <laughs> and as they're passing, one of them looks up at him and smiles at him. <laughs> Albertine, who? <laughs> He only had her, he was able to find out her last name, which was mistaken in the form that he found it out, but then he made inquiries, sort of innocent inquiries, to find the name of that girl. <laughs> and so now, I don't think I'll be able to finish it. <laughs> but he's starting to fall, he hasn't even spoken to her yet, but already he's in love with her, and trying, trying to find a way to find out where she's living, <laughs> which people shall be visiting so that they can go to, to visit that distinguished lady at the same time that the girl is visiting there. <laughs> yeah. So he's gotten over one craving, and now he's building up another one. Okay, but our task to be completely free of dukkha <laughs> is not leaving behind one object of craving and then latching on to another, but to eliminate the craving. <laughs> and so we could see, you know, partly by, in the, our experience, reducing craving helps to reduce dukkha, but what we take on trust is that it's possible to completely eliminate craving and in that way com reach the end of dukkha, the end of suffering. So that is the, the core principle taken on trust. And then what we take, this next thing we take on trust is the Noble Eightfold Path. You know, we can see maybe in our experience as we adopt the path and start practicing the path, we can see how it helps us to reduce craving and thereby reduce dukkha. But what we accept on trust is that if we cultivate this path to the end, to the level of Lokutara, the world transcending dimension, that we can completely eradicate dukkha and gain that unsurpassed liberation of the mind. So that is taken on trust, through trust and confidence. Okay, now what I have here is the next aspect of right view. This is the right view that, yeah, it's the, the right view of insight that will lead to that liberating wisdom. And so it's when cultivating this view of what are called the three characteristics, which we recite in, in the morning and in the evening, that all conditioned things are impermanent, all conditioned things are dukkha, all dharmas are anatta, non-self. So that is the view that's cultivated in the development of insight, the right view that brings liberation. And so here we have a statement of this kind of right view. So this is this actually a quite standard passage that occurs over and over. So the Buddha asked the monks, what do you think is material form, this bodily form, permanent or impermanent? It's impermanent. Is what is impermanent suffering or happiness, pleasurable or unpleasurable? So it's dukkha. It's not necessarily suffering in the sense of being painful, but it's inherently unsatisfactory. And then, what is impermanent, unsatisfactory, and subject to change, should it be regarded as, this is mine, this is what I am, 
this is my essential self, then the answer is no. And that is applied to feeling, perception, the volitional activities, and consciousness. And so when one has that insight into the three characteristics, wait, actually, I skipped over. Okay, so one starts off first with seeing that the, th the five aggregates are not mine, not I am, this is not myself. Then the Buddha generalizes and he says, therefore, any kind of material form, bodily form, whatever, whether internal or external, I have abbreviated, Ajitam Bahidata, whether past, present, or future, internal or external, gross or subtle, superior or inferior, far or near, all material forms should be seen as it actually is with correct wisdom. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. Any kind of feeling, any kind of perception, any kind of volitional activities, any kind of consciousness should be seen. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. Okay, then seeing thus, the noble disciple becomes disenchanted with the five aggregates. Through this disenchantment, he becomes dispassionate, that's viraga, the ending of that attachment. Through that dispassion or detachment, or end of attachment, the mind is liberated and one understands it's liberated, that birth is finished, the spiritual life has been lived, what had to be done has been done. There is no coming back to any state of conditioned existence. Okay, so now, so that takes care of the three types of right view. Now what we're going to do in the next stage of our practice is initially, just for some minutes, to again go into the Buddha Nusati, the recollection of the Buddha, focusing the mind on it. And then what I'm going to do is kind of guided practice, is shift the practice into the mode of insight, into the non-self nature of the five aggregates. Now this is not, I have to give this sort of provision, this is not the actual insight knowledge, it's not the vipassana jnana, which really comes, at least from myself, almost all people, you have to do like a long extended course of practice to build up very strong, consistent mindfulness and strong at least a strong, fairly strong degree of samadhi, and then start exploring with true insight. But I call this a kind of, what's the expression that I use? Reflective wisdom. It's a sort of reflection, reflective contemplation that is in accord with the insight knowledge of non-self. And so we'd be using discursive thought in order to examine the five aggregates involved in the process of um, recollection of the Buddha in order to at least try to discern their non-self nature, or at least direct the mind towards the non-self nature of the five aggregates. Okay, does anybody have any questions now? Don't ask me how this is going to be done, because that's what I'm going to be doing when we actually enter the meditation. Um, I have a question about the distinction between faith and trust and confidence. Yeah. So how do you, to me, I still translate it to faith, just because it's not, see, you know, it's something that you kind of go with, yeah, yeah. because because it is, yeah, without yeah. necessarily being able to prove it to yourself. Yeah. So how do you distinguish the two? It's not so much that I'm distinguishing the two, but I'm just using almost like a synonym, or let's say it's an aspect of faith, okay. is this trusting confidence. Right. So it's being willing to accept on trust things that stem from the enlightenment of the Buddha that one can't see and verify for oneself right now. 
this reminds me like this. Sometimes I've seen this statement, people even who have like very pro-Buddhist websites or Facebook pages, I'll say, it'll be like a quotation, don't accept anything that you can't like, verify for yourself. Don't accept anything that you can't experience for yourself then under that, under that the Buddha. <coughs> no, the Buddha never said that. <laughs> when the Buddha was speaking to the Kalamas, the famous Kalama Sutta, the Kalamas were not the disciples of the Buddha at the beginning. So the, the, the Kalamas came and they were asking, they were confused because they heard this teacher is teaching that. This teacher comes and says, no, don't believe that, believe me. The next one says, don't believe the first two, believe me. So they came to the Buddha and said, we're confused, we don't know what to accept. So the Buddha wants to plant in them the seeds of this trusting confidence. So he doesn't say, don't believe anything except what you could verify. But he questions them about things that they might be able to verify. And then, of course, these are things that relate to the here and now. So the Kalamas say, yes, we can see this, yes, we can see that. But the Buddha is not teaching you know, the higher aspects of his dharma, but just the sort of preparatory aspects that are visible right here and now. Okay, any, any other questions? Okay, then since we've been sitting now a bit more than an hour, maybe first stand up and stretch.